How is it going, everybody? And welcome to this mini lecture on plot, setting, point of view, and character. These are just kind of a few of what I think are, I don't know, some of the more essential kind of building blocks of talking about uh, fiction uh, primarily, but also uh, a lot of these things do very much carry over to uh, discussions of poetry and discussions of drama. So let us dive straight in. What is plot? Well, uh, a lot of times when we first think about plot, we think about what happens in the story. You know, what's the plot of a story? Uh, you know, this, this happens, then this happens, then this happens. Um, but in a lot of ways, it's kind of uh, a mischaracterization of what plot actually is. And we would call that action. What is the action of a story? Or what is the story of a story? Um, you know, what happens? When we're talking about plot, we're really talking about the way in which the author has sequenced and paced events. So the order that events fall and the amount of time that gets spent on these events. So um, you can see here with our illustration, plot really, you know, it focuses mostly on sort of the relationship between a couple of big things, whereas story or, or action is really concerned with, you know, all of the minute details of exactly what happens. So uh, let's think about the importance of sequencing. I've got two example sentences here. The king died and then the queen died. Uh, and then the queen died after the king died. How does this one little change? Like, how are these two sentences different? Um, that's very much the effect that sequencing really kind of gets in here uh, you know the king died and then the queen died it's like okay well the the king died and then at some point later on in the future the queen died like it's king dies first then the queen later on but the the set that second sentence the queen died after the king died that very much it kind of it feels like there's a little bit of a causal relationship there the queen died after the king died she died of heartbreak she died of you know, uh, what, what have you, you know, there's, there's, the relationship is complicated a little bit. As far as pacing is concerned, again, that's sort of uh, how much time an author spends on any given, you know, segment sequence. Um, sometimes we, you know, cover large amounts of ground in a couple of pages. You know, it could be a you know significant period of time. It could be, you know, quite literally covering ground. You know, characters could be traveling. Um, and then all of a sudden we are slowed down. And then, you know, and the story of an hour is told over several pages. Uh, we really see this, I think, very, uh, it's very clearly in Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find, where the majority, the bulk of the story, you know, covers the, the sort of the first several, you know, hours, the first several days of this family's road trip and then all of a sudden you know the last like 10 pages or so covers the space of maybe 10 minutes so it's you know interesting why why does o'connor do that uh, as far as conflicts are concerned conflicts are going to be present in every single plot uh there is no plot without conflict uh, and they can be external the, uh, the conflict can be occurring between our main character, the protagonist, uh, which is a term we'll talk about a little bit later on in this video, and um, you know someone or something else. Or the conflicts can be internal. Uh, the protagonist can be struggling with you know their decision to do or to not do something uh, with you know struggling against their worst impulses or something like that. So uh, here we have, a chart that you may have seen before, you may be familiar with this, it's called Freytag's Pyramid. And it really does a good job of kind of illustrating, <clears throat> excuse me, what, how, how plot generally tends to function. And this is a, a very traditional, uh, you know, approach here. Um, you know, not every plot follows this, this pattern, but quite a few do. So we begin with the exposition uh, over here on our left. Uh, we begin with the exposition. This is where we are meeting our characters. We are finding out who who's involved, what's going on, where are we, and you know we are just kind of 
introduced to the background. This is where we get all of the information that we need to be able to make sense of the story to come. And then something happens, the inciting incident, the plot, uh, the, uh, sorry, not the plot, the co conflict is really introduced. Something propels our main character forward and really kind of pushes them to, uh, you know, go. As the plot continues, the level of intensity increases, and this is what we call rising action. Uh, you'll also sometimes see in here uh, the term complications thrown around, and complications refer to sort of like little mini challenges that the protagonist has to overcome. Uh, these are, you know, challenges that they have to to, to, to move beyond before they can finally get to the climax. The climax is the single most intense moment in a story. It's when everything is coming to a head. It's the final battle. If there is a battle, it's the final confrontation. You know, it's, it's that moment where every, like, things could not possibly get more intense. After the climax, after that moment hits, we have falling action. Things are starting to kind of move back down and become, um, I don't know, closer to normal, I guess. Um, and things are resolved in you know, the resolution. Um, and then our conclusion is where we are sort of finally tidied up here. Uh, you may see in you know, various criticism, various other textbooks or handbooks, you may see the, the French term denouement thrown around to kind of, I don't know, encompass all three of these. Uh, denouement is French for the untying of the knot and, you know, the metaphor being, you know, the in over the course of the plot, things get, you know, complicated and tied up and the, the knot is untied and, you know, things, <laughs> things, things get, uh, you know, looser and, and more, more manageable. Um, it, it's a, it's a, it's a messy term. It's an inconsistently used term. Uh, falling action, resolution, and conclusion are a, a little bit more accurate to what we're talking about here. So uh, as far as some plot-related narrative techniques, in medias res is a technique that refers to beginning the plot in the middle of things, which is literally what in medias res means uh, in Latin. And we see this in a lot of fiction, in a lot of drama. Um, you know, we don't start at the start. We start after some things have already happened. Uh, in Romeo and Juliet, we start well into the conflict between the Montague and the Capulet family. Um, with Hamlet, we start, uh, you know, after King Hamlet has died and, you know, like, like, like a month after. Uh, so, so stuff has already happened. We're already in the middle of things. Um, it's kind of a, in, in a lot of ways, a time-saving measure, in a lot of ways, a, a better setup for um, intensity and a better setup for conflict. Uh, as far as flashback is concerned, this is where our author sort of breaks us away from what's going on in the present, and we look backwards to something that happened before the start of the story. Similarly, uh, on or sort of on the other hand of things, flash forwards kind of flips that, and we look forward to what may or may not happen after the end of the story. Uh, foreshadowing is a technique that authors use to to kind of give us hints about what is going to come in the future. And the really the the important thing and to to sort of remember about foreshadowing is the fact that it's only apparent to us. We only really recognize foreshadowing when we go back and read a story for a second or a third time. We don't immediately think, oh yes, something is going to happen to our characters. We don't really know because we don't know what's happened yet. Uh, but when we go back and we read again, then the foreshadowing, uh, you know, then it, it sticks out to us. Uh, prefiguring is a term to describe uh, where we see something happen early in a story and we see that, you know, almost exactly happen again later on in the story. It's a lot more obvious. It's a lot, uh, a lot less subtle. And then subplots, uh, these refer to sort of minor, um, less important, but concurrently occurring plots. They're not quite the main, you know, the main focus of the story, but they do also have their own buildups and tensions and releases.
So now that we've got the the what happening, let's talk about the where setting. Um, there are really, as far as we're, uh, setting is concerned, there are really two types of setting that we talk about. We talk about temporal setting, which is the when. When is our story set? Is it set in the what we would call the author's time, which is just you know when the author is is composing the story? Is it set in a you know particular time period? Uh, is it set say as we have here with our um, photo of, of Monument Valley? Um, is it set in the Old West, or is it set somewhere in the future on an alien planet? maybe someplace that we doesn't actually exist these are um you know temporal settings uh, and they're tied very to uh, very closely as you can see with geographical or physical settings this is the where um something like monument valley like this is um and then and, and this is really kind of i think the most important part when it comes to setting setting really um in addition to giving us uh you know where and when things are happening it 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 draws a lot on our uh, collective unconscious, kind of, you know, like the, the, the knowledge that we have in the background. Um, we see Monument Valley here, which is one of the most iconic, you know, landscapes uh, as far as the, the American Western is concerned. Quite a few of John Ford's uh, Westerns that the starring John Wayne were, were, were shot here. Um, you know, we see this, we immediately think, oh yeah, it's, it, there, there, there's going to be a Western, there's going to be cowboys, something's going to be going down. Um, we hear it's a, it was a dark and stormy night. We think, okay, well, something spoopy is probably about to happen. Um, you know, these these uh, relationships, these these connotations that come with uh, you know setting, really, it's 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 it gets used to draw on on our previous experiences. So point of view is now we're getting into the, the who's telling the story. Um, it's important to remember when we're reading fiction, uh, particularly that we are never, ever, ever, ever being told the story by the author. We are always being told the story by a narrator. A narrator is mediating the event, what we see of the events. It's holding up a lens, as we can see here, for us to look through and observe. And they get to control what we see and what we know. Now, there are three primary types of narration with their, you know, a few of their own little, like, uh, kind of sub variations. We have third person or, um, excuse me, non-participant narrators. This is where, you know, the stories are told. He did this, she does that, they think this, you know. Um, these can be, they're, 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 the, the narrator is not a participant. They're not, they're not actually in the story that we're reading. Um, this can come in a variety of different sort of models. Uh, omniscient third-person narrators know everything that there is to know. They can see in, inside of all of the characters' thought processes. Um, they, they understand everything. Whereas a limited third-person omniscient would be, um, you know, they could see inside one character's head, but the rest of the characters were, are only really filtered through um, through that 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 one that one character, um, I think the the Harry Potter novel is a really great example of of this. Uh, we really see things filtered very heavily through Harry's perspective, but we don't ever really get into the the brain spaces of like Ron and Hermione or anything. First person or participant narrators are characters in the story. They are participating. They are there. Uh, a lot of times, this is the protagonist. It's the main character who's telling us the story, but not always. Sometimes this could be a, uh, a, a minor character, uh, could be an observer or an attendant. Uh, in some kind of out there cases, it could be like a tree or something that's telling the story of everything that's that's taken, uh, taken place beneath its branches or whatever, uh, but it's there, it's participating. Second person narration is exceedingly rare but it does exist it does happen this is where the story is being told um 
as if you are the one doing things. It's directed, uh, it's speaking directly to us as the reader. You go and do this. Your father picks you up when you get out of prison. I'm uh, sorry, uh, Dennis Lane's short story until Gwen starts that way. It's like your father picks you up from prison and he's got an eight ball of Coke and blah, blah, and whatever. It's crazy. Go and look it up. It's, it's, it's fantastic. You'll love it. Um, but anyway, the point of view, again, it shapes what we see and what we know and how we experience things. And then finally, I want to wrap this uh, video up with a brief discussion of character. You know, the people, the, th the people who are in these stories. Uh, characterization refers to how we learn about the characters. It's uh, how they are shown to us. What are they wearing? How do they talk? What do they do? What do they do for a living? Um, how, you know, when do we see them? How much time do they get? So when we're talking about how is, how is a character characterized, this is what we're talking about. Um, a quick point about heroes and villains versus protagonist and antagonist. Uh, I've used the term protagonist a few times in this video already. And what that really just refers to is the, the, the protagonist is the main central character of a story. Person could be good, person could be bad, uh, evil, neutral, what have you. All that matters is our protagonist is the central character. The antagonist is the person or the force, the thing that our protagonist is up against. Again, could be a hero, could be a villain, uh, could be good, evil, you know, a force of nature. Uh, they're themselves, you know, the, what, whatever the protagonist is, whatever their chief opponent is, that's the antagonist. And I, I very strongly recommend that we use these words instead of oh it's the hero of the story the villain of the story and why why might uh, that be well heroes and villains are larger than life they're almost mythic in structure um like we have with with haku and chihiro here um you know these are they're they're characters who are so far beyond human capacity a captain america uh you know loki thanos the, the darth freaking vader man um these these are characters that that occupy such you know huge enormous positions that um you know they're they don't really hit on that sort of that, that that human element um so when we're talking about you know pretty much everything that we read for this course and nearly everything you read just period um protagonist and antagonist are they're they're more accurate terms so as far as just some labels like how how might we refer to characters um we have major and minor characters major characters are just the, they're the ones that we spend the most time with uh and minor characters are the ones that you know we we see for a moment or two then they kind of go away um they're, they're they're not really the main focus of anything uh, flat and round characters or static and dynamic characters. Uh, these are terms coined by the English novelist E.M. Forster. And uh, they were flat characters are characters that are kind of one dimensional. We see them from one, you know, one perspective only. Um, we don't really know that much about flat characters. Uh, they, they might have a single defining characteristic and that's about what, all we get. Um, whereas round characters are characters that are very much like complete human beings. Uh, I think the uh, really great metaphor that uh, one of my professors when I was uh, in school used was flat characters are kind of like a painting. You know, they can be incredible. They can be beautiful. They can be life changing, but you only can look at them from that one perspective. You're just, you, you're looking straight on at the painting. Whereas round characters are more like a sculpture. You can walk around them. You can look at them from all kinds of different angles and stuff like that. Um, static characters are characters that don't change over the course of a story and dynamic characters are characters that do have you know, that do change uh, throughout the course of a story. And stock characters are, um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this in another video, but stock characters are characters that we've seen so many times 
over and over and over again. Again, as sort of part of that cultural consciousness that we immediately see them and we know what to expect. We immediately see the strong, silent cowboy and we say, oh yeah, they're probably a loner, just rolled in out of nowhere. They've probably got some troubled backstory because we've seen enough Clint Eastwood movies to know that's what we should be expecting. The same thing, uh, the wise old wizard. Well, they're probably going to teach the protagonist something. They're probably going to show up and save the day at some point. And they're definitely going to be, you know, like the smartest person in the room. Uh, we know what to expect with the mad scientist. Uh, you know, the, these are these are stock characters. They're characters, again, very much drawn from the sort of the history of literature. We we know what to, we, we know what they are. Um, that's not to say that 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 they can't be unique, um, or that they can't be special, or again that they can't be incredible, but it's very much characters that rely on things that we already know. So anyway, that about wraps this one up. Thank you all very much, and I will see you in the next video.